Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> In my country, we usually loosely say being a program director is very easy because you, have, you are simply dishing out dishes that are prepared with passion. But today, let me tell you, it is not easy. So I do not agree with my people. Nevertheless, good morning, I mean good afternoon to the university management, the guest speaker, Prof. Michael Borwell, uh, the family of DDT Chababu, deans, HODs, academic staff, support staff that is here, and everybody who have joined us in this DDT Chababu public lecture that is going to address social, political, or oh, historical, maybe sensitive issues to some that are living in South Africa. Several of, of, um, of our amazing guests have flown across the world to be here today. It means so much to have you as the university uh, community at Forte. I will stop now because I'm a closer, talks a lot. <laughs> I will stop and invite our executive dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, Prof. Neil Ross, up to do the introduction and the welcome for this public lecture. Over to you, Professor Ross. Thank you very much, Doctor, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, we gather here today for the DDT Jabavu Lecture, titled About Du Bois in Africa, which will be presented by Professor Michael Barawoy. But first, a couple of special introductions. Right in front, the Deputy Chair of Council, Dr. Koyana, and I must say, I'm just blown off my feet to have the Deputy Chair of Council at a faculty event. I've never, I've never encountered that before, and I'm, I'm delighted. There's Dr. Kayan. We have the Vice-Chancellor. He's graced us at a number of events, but I'm no less delighted to see him. And then we have several members of the Jabavu family, which is important. We talking in today's lecture as we do in the noni Jabavu lectures in the name of the family. The family have to be part of these events. They have to share with us. Um, they have to be able to comment about what we're doing and most importantly tell us where we're going wrong. So today I would like to to extend a welcome to Ms. Yulisa Jabavu Nglovo. <laughs> Ms. Nglovo is great-granddaughter of Alexander Macaulay Jabavu, who was the brother of DDT. Then we need to, 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 to welcome also Mr. Matewelanga Nglovo. Is, is Mr. Nglovo Oh, okay, he's not in the house today. He was a great-grandson, too, of, of Alexander Macaulay. Ms. Sibusiwa Nglovu, I know, is here. <laughs> who's the great-great-granddaughter of Alexander Macaulay. And I had, a, I had a chat with her beforehand, and I'm going to have another one after, and we're going to persuade her to become a historical sociologist. <laughs> um, then we have as the vice chancellor's guests some of the luminaries of the South African Academy, people whom I've looked up to for many, many years and been influenced from the peripheries where I've worked. Professor Eddie Webster. <laughs> Professor Luli Kalinikos.
And I would like to point out that Professor Kal Kalinikos holds an honorary doctorate from this university. Sometimes we pick well. Um, and Professor David Cooper. Then we have some Dean's guests who are the next generation of sociology in this country, I believe. And they're also members of the Future Professors Program, which is a marvelous initiative, if I may say so myself, to, to help prepare a next generation professoriate for the South African universities. Not people who do the same thing as us old codgers, but people who do things differently. Professor Crispin Chinguno. <laughs> Professor Mondli Shatswayo. <laughs> Mondli. <laughs> Professor Simba Gurukome. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. And to all of you too who are attending and to those who are online. Now, as I read Professor Boroway's abstract. What I'm anticipating today is a tale of ironies, of connections, of fundamental disagreements about freedom and intellectual entanglements. Also, a tale about transatlantic engagements. And this tale links today's lecture to us, to Professor Boroway, to DDT Jabavu, to W.E.B. Du Bois, and to arguments about freedom, which should be a central concern of the humanities, wherever we teach them. But first, a word on DDT Jabavu, after whom we name this August series. Now, as you well know, we already have a Jabavu lecture series, the Noni Jabavu series, and DDT Jabavu was Noni's father. He was born in 1885 and son of John Tengel Jabava, Jabavu, who was a founding member of the then South African Native College, which later became Fort Hare. Um, I guess this is a long way of reiterating that the Jabavu family have deep links in, in our, our beautiful university. Now, as a youngster, um, DDT Jabavu was was unable to enroll at, at the local White House of Education in, in King Williamstown. So he was sent to a Quaker school in Wales, followed by a degree at the University of London, which he took in 1912. And sometime thereafter, he traveled to Tuskegee in Alabama to look at Booker T. Washington's approach to so-called industrial education. This was a time when black intellectuals of the world were, were exploring how to make their ways in what was a very segregated colonial world, Explore, exploring early 20th century pathways to freedom. Anyway, DDT Chabavu then returned to South Africa and in 1916 he took up a position in languages at the University of Fortier, which he held for nearly 30 years and he was our university's first black professor. During his time, he regularly argued for better farming. He argued for the values of manual work, um, and he argued for racial cooperation. In that sense, he was much like, like, like Booker T. Washington, whom he had encountered at Tuskegee. He was also a founding member of the South African Institute of Race Relations in 1929, and in 1936, when, when, when a person who some called Prime Minister, one J.B.M. Herzog, um, introduced a raft of segregationist measures, um, DDT headed the All Africa Convention, which opposed these measures. He's the author of some notable books, The Black Problem, 1920, The Segregation Fallacy, and other papers. And and, what a, and a biography of his father, the life of John Tengel Jabavu. Let's turn now to Du Bois, who's central to today's lecture. Du Bois lived between 1868 
1963. So he was more or less a contemporary of Jabal. He was a sociologist, and after studying in Germany, he became the first African American to earn a doctoral degree in Harvard. And at this point, we're not saying anything about professors who study dishonesty and the kind of data they use. We'll keep that for another day. Um, du Bois was party to the formation of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And he also interacted with the very same Washington, Booker T. Washington. But unlike Du Bavu, he was a very strong critic of, of Washington. Yet, even as he was a critic of Washington, he remained in correspondence with DDT Jabavu. So what we see here are these black men of letters, while sometimes occupying very oppositional positions with respect to freedom in the respective racist worlds they lived in, they could and they did sustain cordial worlds of correspondence and exchange between each other. Now, let's talk about the nub of this disagreement. Du Bois and his supporters opposed what was the, the so-called Atlanta Compromise, which had been crafted by Booker T. Washington, whereby Southern blacks would submit to white political rule, while Southern whites would in turn guarantee Southern blacks receive economic and educational opportunity. It sounds like I'm, I'm going to come to the comparative element of that in a moment. But Du Bois opposed this. He insisted that the only way to imagine black freedom was full civil rights and political representation. This was unambiguous, it was clear, and it was put short. He spoke against racism, and he was also a pan-Africanist. Um, among his most favorite, famous works were The Souls of Black Folk, which he wrote in 1903. Um, which enunciated a central thesis, which said the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, which is a truism that scholars of race and racism, including myself, still regularly use today. In 1935, he wrote Black Reconstruction in America, which was a sociological masterpiece, which challenged the prevailing orthodoxy that black people um, through, through not not, not agreeing with the principles or laziness or whatever. We're responsible for the failure of reconstruction. Now, Du Bois' radicalism and his public politics marginalized him within the academy. And as late as about 1999, when I arrived in the African American studies at, at Brown University, which was a lonely place on the... the East Coast of America, I noticed that Du Bois was relegated from the status as a major sociologist to a figure in black studies, which meant that the, 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 those in the mainstream sociology department, in the foundational discipline of sociology, they could easily avoid serious engagement with Du Bois. Now, the types of debates between Washington and Du Bois about black freedom were also taking place in South Africa. In fact, they took place in South Africa probably until the 1980s. Um, recently deceased politicians were part of those debates, talking about, about we will accept this, 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 this terrible compromise where, where we get a bit of land and a bit of education and a bit of independence and a casino. Um, so those debates remain that, that, that took place between Du Bois and, and Washington track to our country. And today, Professor Burroway looks at the impact of Du Bois as a theorist, a sociologist, a humanist for Africa and South Africa. And although Du Bois' work comes with much freight and impact, as Professor Burrow will show, um, he's not had an awful lot of purchase in the South African Academy until fairly recently. I remember returning from Brown, invigorated and excited by what Du Bois' work told me about racism and the white problem. And 
alas, my excitement was greeted only with sort of polite acknowledgement rather than any kind of deep or critical engagement, even at clever places like Waza. Um, so, today we will hear about connections, but we'll also hear about differences across the Atlantic between these leading protagonists in the 20th century world of black liberation, stretching all the way here to Alice, and we will hear about the relevance of Du Bois for today. And this is a reminder, my colleagues, this is an important reminder that while we live in a deeply rural area, that... While sometimes the lights do not work over here, or the water too, and we complain sometimes, that actually the stuff that really matters, the world of ideas, connects us to bigger circuits, bigger universes, a bigger globe, relating to liberation and freedom. That's the excitement of Fort Hare that I, that I hope you share with me today and every day that we are part of this. Um, Michael Barawoy is Professor of Sociology at the University of Berkeley, and he was educated at Cambridge, Zambia, and Chicago. And he worked initially on sociology in the workplace. One of his most well-known works, and I would argue one of the most famous books in modern sociology, is, the manuf is Manufacturing Consent, Changes in the Labor Process Under Monopoly Capitalism where he asks how and why it is that workers give their consent to modern capitalism just as they're being exploited, their wages being reduced, their benefits being rolled back. It's a crucial question about the operation, about the sociology of capitalism. Michael comes to his work from a Marxist perspective and certainly this very book was extremely influential in what used to be, no, or the, or, or I suppose what still is, in the history workshop many, many years ago, where people engaged with it. They were very interested in, in, work, in, in the workplace. And indeed, I've even used it quite recently in my own work on the labor process in the racist apartheid Staatsdienst. He uses methods of ethnography, he uses the extended case study and participant observation, methods which I might add are not that different to those employed by the Chicago anthropologists. He's worked as a furnace operator in Hungary for his book, The Radiant Past, Ideology and Reality in Hungary's Road to Capitalism in 1992. And in this respect, there's a point of affinity with Crispin, who worked as a train driver before coming to sociology. And we can only but wonder what massive insight these experiences bring to their respective work. More recently, Michael's turned his work to, to what sociology as a discipline in universities is, how it's taught and how it enters into the public domain, public sociology. He's been chair of the American Sociological Association. He's been chair of the International Sociological Association, and he must have sinned egregiously because he was twice head of department in his university. With this, I'll give you over to Professor Michael Barraway. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, you actually, it was a fantastic introduction, not only because you said such, so many nice things about me, but because you actually foregrounded the sorts of things I'm going to talk about today, and you said it in a much clearer fashion than I probably will be able to. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I should say that um, South Africa has been the inspiration for me to be a sociologist. I was first in South Africa in 1966, um, which is probably before three quarters, no, I think 90%, no, perhaps 95% of the people here were born. Um, yeah. Um, and in 1966, I met Luni Kalinikos and um, 
Uh, the rest is history. Um, I've been coming back to South Africa, not during the boycott era, but since 1990, and it has continually inspired the sort of sociology that I do, and it's so great to see so many of my friends and critics here in the audience. Um, it is a total honor to be giving this lecture here at Fort Hare. So I would first like to thank your Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Pushlyungu. I've been practicing how to pronounce your name, but I've not probably got it quite right. I need to spend a few more days here. Um, and it's great that uh, the Deputy Chair of the Council is here too. I know, if I may say so, Sakela um, from Witz, and we had a wonderful walk around the Wild West. Wild West? Wild West Coast. Okay, mustn't forget the coast. Yes. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for inviting me here. Um, it's an honor to be giving the DDT Jababu Lecture. Um, and I'd just like to recognize the members of the family who are here the great granddaughter and great great granddaughter of the younger brother of DD Dijapavu, as I understand it. Um, and I, to give this lecture, I decided I'd better find out something about your great great grandfather. Oh, it's not actually your great great uncle. It, anyway, something like that. Um, yes, I've, so I decided I would look into, and, 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 and as Dean Roos, as that was already said, he, he was a very interesting figure and bears a lot of interesting comparisons with W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes. So what I'm going to do is I should also like to thank all the people who have been organizing this event, which is I had no idea, you know, how complicated it was to go from East London to Hogsback, which I had been once before, and uh, to now come here. So, so let me thank uh, Irma and Andres and uh, the, the uh, Zoe, I don't know if she is here, and, to, and uh, others who have been organizing my trip to this very wonderful area. And I've never, I, I've never been actually at the edge before. I recommend if you haven't been there that you spend some time looking at the views, particularly when you get somehow frustrated with, with the direction of South Africa. I believe some people are, are a bit frustrated, yes. Okay, okay, let me, uh, yes, I've got to be careful about making controversial statements today. Now, who was W.E.B. Du Bois? We've already heard something about W.E.B. Du Bois. He was an extraordinary scholar. He uh, was the first African-American to get his PhD um, to get a PhD from Harvard University. Before then, he was at Fisk University. Um, this is in the 18, uh, he was at Fisk University in the 1880s and then uh, goes to Harvard in 18, 1891 or 90, and then actually goes to the University of Berlin, where many of the famous scholars used to go for training in those days came back from there to, the, to take a position in Wilberforce University. It was clear to all that this guy was a genius. I mean, that he was really an extraordinary figure, but he was black. And that meant that he could not take up a position in the place, places he deserved. He had to go to a historically black university, Wilberforce. Yeah. He was a public intellectual lived a long life. He lived from 1868 to 1963. He outlived everybody, 95 years old, and never stopped writing and revising his ideas. Yes, extraordinary figure. He was, as I say, a public intellectual in the sense that once he decided that the university was not a hospitable place for somebody like himself, he became one of the founder members of the NAACP, 
the National Association for the Advancement of Colour People, one of the major civil rights organisations in 1910. He became the editor of Crisis magazine, which was the magazine of the NAACP, and came out six times a year, one of the most popular magazines amongst African Americans. And it had a significant political impact. He was editor from 1910 to 1933. So 24 years, yes. And he was a political activist. And this is very important when we compare to DDT Jababu, a different form of politics. W.B. Du Bois was early on a socialist of the line, he said, a socialist. He was a civil rights, civil rights activist. He was a Pan-Africanist and organized five Pan-African Congresses, starting with the one in 1919 after the First World War, 1921, 1923, 1927, and 1945, the most significant of the Pan-African Congresses. He was also, and got him into deep trouble, he was also a peace activist after the Second World War, and as such, his alliance was closer with the Soviet Union, and as such, um, he got into real trouble with the US state, and he was indicted for being an undeclared foreign agent, of, agent of a foreign principle, namely the Soviet Union. In the end, the court case, was he was acquitted, but his passport was taken away and he couldn't travel for the next eight or nine years. But he was an enemy of the US state. Now, many people actually, when they go in exile, they go to the United States. But in this case, W.B. Du Bois left the United States and in 1961 accepted the invitation of Kwame Nkrumah to, be, to spend his life in exile in Ghana. This was uh, this was four years after the independence of Ghana. And he died in 1963 in Ghana. That is just to give you an idea. I divide up his life into four parts. The first part is scholar denied, when he is, in a sense, forced out of the academy because he cannot actually realize his goals. But in the period 1897 to 1910, where he's at the Atlanta University, he develops what is now regarded to be the foundations of US sociology, namely the Atlanta School, which antedated the Chicago School by 20 years. Now, and it's a strange thing to be an unrecognized founder. Can one be an unrecognized founder? But nevertheless, that is, the day, that is the claim today amongst US sociologists. I should add, by the way, it's no great achievement to be a founder of US sociology, which is rather a parochial discipline in my view. But he was much, much more. He was much more than a founder of US sociology. He was a major figure, historian, and he wrote these, as Dean Roos has already said, has already, he wrote some really path-breaking books. And I'm going to read to you from one of them today. And his magnum opus, as we've already heard, was Black Reconstruction, which transformed people's understandings of what happened after the Civil War in the United States. Unfortunately, I will not get into that today because I have to stick to time, right? Now, how much time do I have, Vice Chancellor? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> the magnanimity of a Vice Chancellor is extraordinary. All right, I will try and finish within 55 minutes or earlier, yes. Okay, right. So there were four. Scholar denied is the first phase. He, and he then left the university, as I already said, in 1910. He then became scholar unbound, as he was the editor of the Crisis magazine. And he was, he, he was forced out of that position in 1933. And he moved into the, back to the university, University of Atlanta, another historically black university, and he, and he there wrote Black Reconstruction, his magnum opus, 700 pages, I warn you, small print, be careful, okay? I advise you to read the beginning and the end. Don't worry about the middle for the time being. 
That's not general advice, okay? Um, <laughs> anyway, so that was the period I call scholar, first we had scholar denied, scholar unbound, scholar radicalized, and then he was forced out of the university. He was not somebody to take um, other people's um, orders or authority, whatever their race, and he could be a very tough guy. I think he would be, I don't know if I would want to have to actually do an interview with him. He's, he was, he was a, uh, a relentless um, academic, intellectual, of, of, of quite intimidating scale. Anyway, he was forced out of the university and then began a new period, what I call scholar persecuted. So those are the four phases. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm, the title of my talk is about Du Bois in South Africa. Now, you might think he visited South Africa, but he never visited South Africa because he was denied a visa many times. Um, he had always wanted to be in South Africa and to visit South Africa. In fact, he only visited Africa the first time was in 1923 when he visited Liberia, which was run by African Americans. And he at that time had a sort of blinkered view. He thought if a country is run by African Americans, then it must be a wonderful country. And he misunderstood the fact that the African Americans too can be colonizers. He later revised his view. Yes, right. Mm. Okay. So, now, so he never visited South Africa until 1961, after 1923. Now, he was, as people have pointed out, in communication with quite a few South Africans. So, Plotky was one of them, perhaps the, the one he was in most uh, direct communication, but DDT Jabava was another. So they were in correspondence with one another. And actually, Du Bois read out DDT's representation to the, to the Pan-African Congress of 1921. So they had a close relationship. So it's not entirely true that Jabavu was actually the one who was sort of siding with Booker T. Washington with a sort of narrower vision of freedom uh, against W.B. Du Bois. I think he understood both of the positions and they both influenced him. Yes, so what I want to do today in my remaining 50 minutes is, is actually to try and put DDT Jabavo into a conversation with W.B. Du Bois. This is my conversation, it's my imagination. And, I'm, and I assume that I will be corrected by people who know more about DDT than I do, though I have been trying to catch up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about their lives, what they have in common, and then how they diverge. And I'm going to draw on, I hope it will work, I'm going to draw on a book that that uh, Dean Roos has already referred to, The Souls of Black Folk, perhaps the most widely read of Du Bois' books. And I'm going to actually contrast that with, a article, with an article called The Souls of White Folk. Ah, that's going to be interesting. You will have to keep in your head, as I will say again, Africa, but also and this may be provocative, it may not, but also when I read to you the relationships between Israel and Palestine. So we will, we will be, I will introduce you to Du Bois's writings in a book called Dark Water, which is a critique of the souls of black folk. Dark Water was written in 1920, the souls of black folk in 1903. All right. Okie dokie, pokey pokey, yeah. I'm not used to standing still, but I'll try and stand still. I may have to, um, I may have to take this mic, but let's, let's, let's see what my, what my PowerPoint says. Okay, very good. Oh, I have to do this, do I? Uh, yes, I have to do this? Yep, okay. All right, <laughs> let's see. They were both Methodists, Methodists. So they were, now, Du Bois was a Methodist 
he grew up in a Methodist community, a broadly white community, in, 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 in a place called Great Barrington in Massachusetts, United States, the Northwest. Um, Northeast, sorry. Um, of course, as you probably better than I, um, uh, Jabavu was the son of, of, of Tengo, who was very much a Methodist and bound up in the Methodist community and uh, in the missionary community. So they both were brought up there. I think that, I think that in the end, Jabavu took the Methodism more seriously than Du Bois, but their whole lives were shaped by their by the, the Methodism, and if you, you, I don't know about Jabavu, but Du Bois, every day, he was a, you know, he had a timetable. You know, I've got to write so many pages this morning, and then I've got to talk to so-and-so and answer so-and-so many. His life was, was, was a representation of the wonders of the work ethic. All right, both Methodists, education, big deal. Um, for both of them, they saw education as progress. Yes. So I've already said a little bit about it. So um, Jabavu, Jabavu as, as, as Dean Roos, Roos has already told us, um, was actually is an interesting story that he, tr Tengo, his father, wanted to get the son, DDT, into a local white school. He believed very strongly, like, well, he believed very strongly that, there's, that equality, equal rights for all civilized, he used the word men, we can say people perhaps, um, but I won't get into that debate. So, but actually, Tengo really struggled to get DDT, his son, into Dale College, which was all white. And, uh, and I, I, I discovered yesterday that David Cooper has some sort of links to, um, to, 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 to Dale, Dale College. His father, your father, was a Spencer Dale. And you were telling me how the whole Dale College today is now African. And then, of course, it was white. Yes. Anyways, he didn't get in. So he went off to Wales, Colwyn Bay. Again, it was through missionary contacts. Um, then he went to, he went to, he got a university degree, one of the first Africans from South Africa to get a university degree from London, where he studied uh, English and Latin. And then he went to Birmingham, where he got a teacher's certificate. And he was about 11 years in, 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 in England before coming back to South Africa and to this part of the world. And he then, as I will say more about in a minute, he then became the first, the first African lecturer at this university, Fort Hare. Which, by the way, is quite a, in some ways similar to the Fisk University, which um, Du Bois went to um, uh, when he left school in, 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 in Western Massachusetts. Um, and he... At T Fisk was, was one of those schools that were built, again, by Christians, missionaries, after the Reconstruction period, which was um, after 18, 1876. Anyway, the point is um, uh, that they went to similar schools. Du Bois, of course, went then to Harvard, and he, um, and he went to the University of Berlin. They were both extremely educated for their time. And they believed in the importance of education, and they believed in, the, and in, in what Du Bois called the talented tenth. They believed in the responsibility of those who are educated to actually represent the broader population of, in this, in this case, Africans or African Americans. And they were very committed to the idea of Western civilization. Um, Perhaps controversially, Du Bois actually was interesting about this. Du Bois, said, du Bois says, Western civilization. And he was a student of, he had studied Greek and Latin at Fisk University. Western civilization, yes, it's superior. But why is it superior? Because Europeans had appropriated ideas and things from the rest of the world. Not surprisingly, Western civilization is superior, Du Bois says. So he had already, as we'll see, quite a, 
a, a, a, a, a, a, a, a, even at an early age, began to develop an understanding of the inequalities in the world and the relationships among nations. Okay, both in their early years in particular um, made appeals to whites. DDT's father was, got into trouble um, when he built alliances with the Africana Bond and he supported the 1913 Native, Native Lands Act and that um, his son, DDT, um, did not support that, as, most, as many Africans did not support the squashing of, of Africans into small areas, 13% of the land area. And so his son actually waited until his father died before he began entering into politics. It's interesting. Um, DDT wrote a biography as a father in 1922. His father had died in 1921. And the one thing he criticized his father for is for supporting the Land Act of 1913. Yeah. So, so you can see that even though he was critical of his father and generally had a more critical disposition, nonetheless, um, he too was very much building alliances with, with, with whites in the Cape area. Um, yes, yes. And his major project, his life project, DDT's life project, was to defend the non-racial franchise in the Cape. That was his project, and in the end, he failed to do so, as I will say in a few minutes. So this is the entry into politics. So as I said, um, DDT, I hope you don't mind if I contract DDT Jabavo to DDT, he, he, he entered politics really until, until 1922. He was a teacher here in Fort Hare, um, the first, as I said, African lecturer here, um, and he was teaching he was teaching English and Bantu and Bantu languages um, and sometimes Latin. So, but in 22, his father was now dead and he became a major proponent of the defense of the non-racial franchise in the Cape, the liberal Cape. Yes. Yes, and Du Bois' entry into politics. Du Bois thought, you know, he wrote a very famous canonical text in 18, published in 1899, called The Philadelphia Negro, which is the foundation work for urban sociology, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, it was one of the first major case studies um, of the African-American population. And so that was his crowning, early crowning achievement as a sociologist. But he was hoping to use sociology to convince whites that blacks are human beings, that they behave and respond to the social conditions of the world around them. And that was the character. He tries to show the ways in which the, the migration from the South in the post in the post-emancipation period after slavery, together with the discriminatory conditions in the Seventh Ward in Philadelphia, they actually contributed to the, they contributed to the behaviors and pathologies of African Americans. But he learned that the whites were not prepared to change their views on the basis of science. And so, as we'll see, in 1903 he wrote a very different type of book, still appealing to whites that blacks are human, but appealing emotionally to them and writing in a literary style that is quite extraordinary. And I recommend you all to read The Souls of Black Folk, a beautiful set of essays about the lived experience of blacks in the South. Yeah, that's entry into politics. And both, both were engaged in a struggle. We've already heard how Du, how du Bois attacking Booker T. Washington. Du, Booker T. Washington wanted basically to say to the whites, and he controlled a lot of the money that was coming to the South, particularly for research. Booker T. Washington said, we must build in Tuskegee, we must build, um, we must build a 
training school for African Americans so that they can develop their skills and get jobs um, in, in skilled or unskilled positions. Du Bois says you cannot give up on the pursuit of political and civil liberties, and he never did. That we have to continue to fight for our political rights. Um, and I think um, that's an article, that's a chapter of the souls of black folk, and I think that also we can see that the big project of both Du Bois and, Bo and, and, and DDT Jabavu was to actually defend and advance the political rights of, 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 of Africans and African Americans. So they had that I in common. Yes. And this is, I guess, a bit more about how they, in a sense, diverged. They moved both, in a sense, from reform to, rev to, to a more radical politics. Du Bois, as I will see in a few minutes, really moves from the souls of black folk, which is all about the conditions of existence of African Americans, to the writings in Dark Water, which, as we'll see, are more of a more rev radical, revolutionary character, a much more deeper critique of the world in which then, and the focus is no longer on the phenomenology of the oppressed, and much more a focus on the oppressors. Yeah. Um, and from then on, from 1920, his writings become even more radical. Um, but I'll say a few words about that later. DDT Jabavu, he, he, he moves into politics, as I said, in 1922. And as Dean Russell has also said, he, he becomes actually a, a, an organizer of the defense, collective defense of the rights of, 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 of Africans, and he becomes the president of the, of the All African Convention, which is a collection of different groups of African Americans. He becomes president in 1936, and that is really the height of his political influence because at that point, he becomes increasingly overtaken by the radicalisms of the non-European unity movement, of the ANC, um, and he's already had conflicts with the um, ICU, the International Commer Commercial Union, read by Kodali. So his, his politics, his politics sort of lag behind the, radic the emerging radicalism. And sad to say, DDT got blamed for the very thing that he was fighting against, namely the separation of the, 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 the voting uh, roll call, that the separate, what was happened in 19, I think it was 1936, um, at the same time as fighting against the Herzog bills for segregation, the, he, became, he became blamed for the actual, um, the separation of the rights of, of Africans for their vote um, uh, that they had a separate, uh, what's it called, separate voting? Hmm? Roll, yeah, separate voting roll, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, so that was, I think, that was the, uh, after that, his, his, his political, his political, um, as a political figure, he, 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 lost, he, lost, he lost influence. But he, he, he remained here at Fort Hare until 1944, teaching. And I always wonder, when I read about this, what was his relationship to this extraordinary university that was cultivating such, ex, such, such a talent of political activists um, for national liberation? As you all know, I mean, such people as Mandela, Tambo, Sabukwe, even Robert Mugabe was here. Um, and I just wonder, this was a sort of hot space for the development of nationalist politics. And I wonder, here is Jababu teaching here. I don't know what was his relationship to these, um, this new generation. OK, finished. Okay, now let me now move on just to tell you a little bit about the souls of black folk. Well, 
These are what's wonderful essays. And these are the essays in the Souls of Black Folk, W.B. Du Bois's, um, perhaps as I said, most widely read book. He talks about very famous concept of double consciousness. He talks about the importance of education through the period of reconstruction. He talks about his animosity to Booker T. Washington. He talks about the ugly side of progress as he sees the rural areas of Alabama and labor repressive agriculture, which is based on sharecropping. And he talks about the depth of segregation in the US South. And he talks very movingly about the passing of his firstborn um, at the age of two and traces, traces that, the death to the discriminatory health system and raises profound questions. He says, he asks himself, am I doing a favor? I mean, is it, should I have encouraged, should, I, should one have a child that is going to be African-American and live up in this racist society? And it's a very moving reflection on the fate of African-Americans at that time in the Jim Crow South. All right, now I want to tell you about Souls of White Folk, 1920. This is Darkwater. This is the critique of the Souls of White Folk. We're moving away from the lived experience of African-Americans, and we're now focusing, we're now focusing on the oppressors, the white oppressors. You see, the souls of black folk, he's talking, in a sense, to whites, trying to convince black, them that blacks are human. By 1920, he's given up on that. He's now talking to African Americans about the inhumanity of whites. And the inhumanity of whites is not as just a matter of the way that they dominate and oppress and brutalize African Americans, but that the, how they brutalize one another. Whites in First World War um, carried out atrocious, atrocious attacks on one another. It's one of the most ugliest of the wars. That and it's Europeans fighting one another for what? for the control of Africa, says Du Bois. And he says that before Lenin does, two years later, just so we get the record straight. <laughs> All right, now what I want to do is just to have a few quotes. Here's the autocritique, focuses on the ups, that's what I'm doing. And uh, think Africa, think Israel, Palestine, when, you, when I read these quotes out to you. Let me see what time it is. Whew. Okie dokie. I got about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Yes, sir. All right. Whiteness is something new. This is a big debate these days whether, in fact, racism, racism began with capitalism or preceded capitalism. Du Bois is of no uh, there's no doubt that it was something that came with capitalism. The discovery of personal whiteness among the world's peoples is a very modern thing, a 19th and 20th century matter indeed. The ancient world would have laughed at such a distinction. The Middle Ages regarded skin color with mild curiosity, and even up into the 18th century, we were hammering our national mannequins into one great universal man, in which race was, did not figure as a device, divisive, if, divisive technique, with fine frenzy which ignored color and race even more than birth. Today, we have changed all that. And the world, in a sudden emotional conversion, has discovered, the world, quotes, has discovered that it is white, and by that token, wonderful. You're in, in these passages, you're going to have to get a sense of the sarcasm of W.B. Du Bois. Sights, whiteness is something new. And as will become clear, it is the product of capitalism. White supremacy. Racial contempt. My, and this is, this is, this is Du Bois' rendition of a white speaking to a black. My poor, unwhite thing, 
Weep not, nor rage. I know too well that the curse of God lies heavily on you. Notice the religious way in which whites can justify their domination. And why? That is not for me to say. That's for God to say. But be brave. Do your work in your lowly sphere, praying the good Lord that into heaven above, where all is love, you may one day be born white. I do not laugh. This is a white person. I am quite straight-faced as I ask soberly. But what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it? Then always, somehow or some way, silently but clearly, I am given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever. Amen. Now, you won't hear... DDT Jababu saying something like that. Except actually around 1936 when he gets really desperate about the segregation acts. White supremacy is about hatred, race hatred. Murder may swagger, theft may rule, and prostitution may flourish, and the nation gives but spasmodic, intermittent, and lukewarm attention. But let the murderer be black, or the thief brown, or the violator of womanhood have a drop of Negro blood, and the righteousness of the indignation sweeps the world. Nor would this fact make the indignation less justifiable, did not we all know that it was blackness that was condemned, not crime. The sin was to be black. And here, a passage from the same, the same famous article justifying barbarism against people of color, we have seen mercy for God in these wild days in the name, in the name of civilization, in the name of justice and motherhood. What, we ha what have we not seen right here in America of orgy, cruelty, barbarism, and murder done to men and women of Negro descent? This is the religion of whiteness, as he calls it. Divine right of white people to steal, as he says elsewhere. And now capitalism. The world today is trade. Same article. The world has turned shopkeeper history. The world has turned shopkeeper. History is economic history. Living is earning a living. Is it necessary to ask how much of high enterprise and honorable conduct has been found here? Something to be sure. The establishment of world credit systems is built on splendid and realizable faith in fellow men. But it is, after all, so low and elementary a step that sometimes it looks merely like honor among thieves. Some benefit more than others, for the revelations of highway robbery and low cheating in the business world and in all its great modern centers have raised in the hearts of all true men in our day an exceeding great cry for revolution. That's not DDT language. For revolution in our basic methods and conceptions of industry and commerce. And he is referring to what? What do you think socialism? Speak socialism. Say socialism. Socialism, yes. Yes. That's all right. And now we come to imperialism. Whither is this expansion of the market? What is that breath of life that thought to be so indispensable to a great European nation? Manifestly, it is expansion overseas. It is a colonial aggrandizement which explains and alone adequately explains the world war. That this imperialism explains World War I. European countries fighting for the control of Africa and other parts of the global south. How many of us today fully realize the current theory of colonial expansion, of the relation of Europe, which is white, to the world, which is black? 
and brown and yellow. Bluntly put, that theory is this. It is the duty of white Europe to divide up the darker world and administer it for Europe's good. So we have here a, not just capitalism, but imperialism. The brutality of whites toward each other. Thus the, this is World War I. Thus the hatred and despising of human beings from whom Europe wishes to extort her luxuries has led to such jealousy, such bickering between European nations that they have fallen afoul of each other and have, have fought like crazed beasts. Such is the fruit of human hatred. Yeah. Now I've got a bit of a longer one. The idea of the rise of a white labor aristocracy that, in a sense, the European nations are bribing their working classes to go along with this imperialist project. The scheme of Europe was no sudden invention, but a way out of long pressing difficulties. It is plain to modern white civilization that the subjection of the white working classes cannot much longer be maintained because otherwise they will rise up. If they do not get some concessions from capital, they will, according to Du Bois and others, they will organize themselves as a proletariat that will engage in a struggle against capitalism. Education, political power, and increased knowledge of the technique and meaning of the industrial process are destined to make a more and more equitable distribution of wealth in the near future. The day of the very rich is drawing to a close so far as individual white nations are concerned. But there is a loophole. There is an escape for those white capitalists. There is a chance for exploitation on an immense scale for inordinate profit, not simply to the very rich, but also to the middle class and to the laborers. This chance lies in the exploitation of darker peoples. It is here that the golden hand beckons. Here are no labor unions or votes or questioning onlookers or inconvenient consciences. These men may be used down to the very bone and shot and maimed in punitive expeditions when they revolt. In these dark lands, industrial development may repeat in exaggerated form every horror of the industrial history of Europe, from slavery and rape to disease and maiming, with only one test of success, dividends. Yeah. And now he turns to US democracy and the power of whiteness. America, land of democracy. Yeah. Land of democracy, perhaps we should put it in inverted commas as well as a capital D. Wanted to believe in the failure of democracy so far as the darker peoples were concerned. Absolutely without excuse, she established a caste system, rushed into preparation for war and conquered tropical colonies. She stands today shoulder to shoulder with Europe in Europe's worst sin against civilization. That is, all right, she aspires to sit among the great nations. This is the US, aspires to sit among the great nations who arbitrate the fate of lesser breeds without the law. And she is at times heartily ashamed, evening the large number of new white people whom her democracy has admitted to place and power. These Europeans coming to the United States against this surging forward of Irish and German, of Russian Jew and Slav and Dago, her social bars have not availed. They can't keep them in a lower caste position. But against Negroes, she can and does take her unflinching and immovable stand backed by this new public policy of Europe. She trains her immigrants in the United States to this despising of African Americans from the day of their landing. And they carry and send the news back to the submerged classes in the fatherlands. So Du Bois is arguing that yes, there are Europeans come here and in the beginning they are discriminated against, but slowly but before they, they make gains, gains that African Americans are denied on the basis of their race. And those immigrants, 
carry with them that racism that they then disseminate to the rest of the world, Du Bois is saying. Now we're back to socialism. What's more interesting on your... <laughs> socialism, listen. This is the future. <laughs> socialism of white workers. Even the broken reed on which we had rested high hopes of eternal peace. The broken reed on which we had rested high hopes of eternal peace. The possibility of socialism. The guild of the laborers. That is socialism. The interests of the working class. The front of that very important movement for human justice that socialism will bring. On which we have builded most. Even this flew like a straw before the breath of King and Kaiser. First World War, the idea of socialism evaporated as nations fought against one another. Indeed, the fleeing had been foreshadowed when Germany and America, quote, international socialists, had all but read yellow and black men out of the kingdom of industrial justice. Subtly had they been bribed, but effectively, were they not lordly whites and should they not share in the spoils of rape? High wages in the United States and England might be the skillfully manipulated result of slavery in Africa and peonage in Asia. What is he saying here? He's saying that socialism is indeed a goal worth pursuing. Essentially, the only hope for humankind. But we will not get to socialism as long as the socialists postpone the question of race. If you exclude two-thirds of humanity from the project of socialism, you're only going to build socialism, in quotes, on the backs of that two-thirds. We have to tackle the question of socialism before we can actually transform capitalism. Hmm. The war of races. But what of the darker world that watches? Most men belong to this world. With Negro and Negroid, East Indian, Chinese, and Japanese, they form two-thirds of the population of the world. A belief in humanity is a belief in colored men. If the uplift of mankind must be done by men, then the destinies of this world will rest ultimately in the hands of darker nations. And what then is this darker world thinking? It is thinking that as wild and awful as this shameful war was, it is nothing to compare with that fight for freedom which black and brown and yellow men must and will make unless their oppression and humiliation and insult at the hands of white world cease. The dark world is going to submit to its present treatment just as long as it must and not one moment longer. If the world does not make a path towards and beyond capitalism, so the darker races of the world will take history into their own hands. This is what he is threatening, claiming will happen. And this is how he ends. Does the world have to be the way it is? All this I see and hear, this is Du Bois speaking, up in my tower, where he's observing the world, black and white, like the sociologist, above the thunder of the seven seas. From my narrow windows, I stare into the night that looms beneath the cloud-swept stars. Eastward and westward, storms are breaking greatly, ugly whirlwinds of hatred and blood and cruelty. I will not believe them inevitable. I will not believe that all that was must be. It was not inevitable. That all the shameful drama of the past must be done again. Today, before the sun, light sweeps the silver seas. If I cry amid this roar of elemental forces, must my cry be in vain? Because it is but a cry, a small and human cry, amid Promethean gloom, the ugly side of progress. 
back beyond the world and swept by these wild white faces of the awful dead. Why will this soul of white folk, this modern Prometheus, hang bound by its own bounding? Hang bound by his own binding. He's suggesting that whites are hanging themselves by pursuing by pursuing a racialized order, by pursuing imperialism. They are trapping not just those who are oppressed, but themselves too. Who did I say? Israel, Palestine. I hear, I hear his mighty cry reverberating through the world. I am white. Well and good, O Prometheus, divine thief. It is, is not the world wide enough? for two colors, for many little shinings of the sun? Why then devour your own vitals? Devour yourselves. If I answer even as proudly, I am black. Why can we not live together? Why is there not the possibility of a single humanity? Why do we have to be killing each other? Yeah, that's how he ends that essay. Well, this is 1920, and oops, this is, this is after the First World War, the atrocious brutality which he has witnessed, Europeans slaughtering each other. This is the imagination he has of a socialism in the future, and he's got three actors white capital, white labor, black labor. And he looks at each, what are their interests? What are their interests? What is the interest of capital? The interests of white labor. What are the interests of black labor? And looks at the possibilities of transformation and comes to the pessimistic conclusion that perhaps if we do not have a transformation, if there is not interracial class solidarity, then indeed the darker races of the world will engage will have to engage for their own survival in a race war, the likes of which we have never seen. Du Bois is amazing in that he's able somehow to act out a despair but never lose hope. His, uh, his life is one, his life is one in which he faces despair. He tries everything, every possible solution of the race capitalism, the race capitalism, the racial capitalism project. Every solution. He's always inventing, pretend, and proposing real utopias of what could be. But they all fail. But he never loses hope even till his dying day. So he is not an Afro-pessimist, even though he is quite pessimistic about the possibilities of the future. All right, I've gone on and on and on. Phew, 10 minutes over. Right, let me just conclude then. Du Bois and DDT Jabavu start out very similarly in their commitments to Western civilization, to equality, to the significance of religion, to the importance of education. And these are the optimistic early periods that they both inhabit. Jabavu becomes more political when his father dies in 1921. And he then engages in a politics defending the political rights of Africans in the Cape and more broadly in South Africa. And begins and get, and gets involved and becomes president of the All-African Convention. But politics takes moves beyond him. And with, as I've said, with the development of the ANC, the non-European unity movement associated with Tabata and the labor movement. And so DDT Jabavu sort of retreats 
particularly because he is accused of, 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 of making possible the African role of, for voting. So he moves, his future is in a sense, he's behind the times. The national liberation struggle is taking off. Du Bois is the opposite. Du Bois is the opposite. He, he becomes more radical. 1920 is the beginning of his radicalism, and his vision of imperialism continues. He develops it more profoundly in many ways, and historically, in black reconstruction in America, in the world in Africa, in color and democracy. These are the names of various books, and in the battle and defense of peace. He becomes actually sidelined because he becomes more radical, more radical than the people around him. His confidence in the talented 10th, the African educated elite, his confidence in them subsides as he sees that they are not ready to actually represent African people, that they have their own interests, their own class interests. Yeah. So. So let me come back to the title of the talk. Du Bois in South Africa never comes here. But what is interesting about his writings on Pan-Africanism um, is how he thinks about South Africa. He thinks about South Africa as white supremacy. He does not see in South Africa the growth of the ANC, the growth of the SACP, the growth of the labor movement. He focuses, he focuses on the development the gradualist development in West Africa, the extension of the representation of Africans in the Legislative Council. He's wary of these more revolutionary movements in South Africa. Yeah. So, Du Bois, Du Bois is an interesting figure. I, I, he, he is calling into question the claim of Paul Gilroy about the black Atlantic. What he is saying is that actually, when we put this conversation together, that each of these countries are different countries. They have different projects. And they're national projects. What is interesting about actually Du Bois is that he is a black middle class person in an imperial, an imperial country. And as such, and as such, he sees the world through that lens. He sees Africa in the beginning as sort of a benighted population that would benefit from African Americans running a independent African society. He shifts, but nevertheless, he never, never gets into the, the concrete struggles in Africa. He is seeing Africa later on as an anti-imperial project, but he's not seeing the struggles within Africa. He is not who? Franz Fanon, who does see the actual struggles, how the post-colony can go in different directions. So there are real blinkers, and I think that we have to understand the positionality of DDT Jabavu on the one hand and, and Du Bois on the other that their positionality actually leads them to so blinkered perspectives. We all are blinkered, and we should reflect on those blinkers. And that's what Du Bois and Jabavu do. They are great practitioners of critical engagement. A word that I expropriate from Edward Webster. Um, that they both, in a sense, live a life of reflection on their past, on their mistakes, and at the same time, how their vision of the world changes as the world vision. And I think I have benefited from actually trying to think about putting these two into conversation, and that is where I will end way over time. Sorry about that. Thank you, Prof.
of Ross for the appetizing introduction and the warm welcome. We felt at home and we took our jackets and then really we felt that we are in the right place. Then go back to uh, Professor Coroway. Thanks, thanks so much for the thought-provoking provoking, uh, words. Really, you left us wanting more, but we don't have enough time. Now, we will now take questions from the floor, but I would just um, request that we take three at a time and then we let uh, Prof. Waraway to, to reply, and then we, we, we take another round uh, again. So who, who's going to help me with the... Thank you, Professor Barraway. Um, Sisego Kumalo from the Philosophy Department here at the University of Fort Hare. Um, I'm curious about the function or the place of Frederick Douglass, his foundational question vis-a-vis -vis his confrontation with slavery, and how that subsequently influences W.E. Du Bois' thinking, precisely that comment that you make when he is confronted with the death of his son, <coughs> vis-a-vis -vis the question of freedom, blackness, the Negro in America. And I want to locate that question with another question in terms of DDT Jabavu's response to his father's position on the endorsement of the 1913 Land Act in South Africa. And the juxtaposition here is a juxtaposition of temporality and time. If we think about the sort of first class of intellectuals in South Africa, so we're thinking your J.T. Chabavus, we're thinking your William Wellington Coppers, in consort with the likes of Diosoga, those are black intellectuals who split ontologically the, fu the function of blackness as a political category in South Africa, right? In the sense of you've got the Christian converts and you've got those who do not convert to Christianity. And I'm curious about the younger Jabavu, DDT Jabavu's position in critiquing his father in relation to temporality. So all of these intellectuals, the first generation intellectuals that I'm mentioning, are pro-conversion, they are pro-Christianity. In fact, William Wellington Gropper, right down the road at the Lovedale Literary Society, gave an address in 1885, sort of punting Christian conversion among the black so, so how does one think of the political moment that DDT Jabavu was reflecting on vis-a-vis -vis his father, J.T. Jabavu, in relation to the question of race and the, the negotiation of race by the first generation intellectuals? Thank you. got a quite a clear picture of, of his political positions in the 20s from your quotes. Who? Oh. De Boer. Mm. And, uh, the, but you also mentioned he got, became quite persecuted after 1950. Was his persecution in the 50s also linked to uh, a, a more radical position? On, you know, had he, had he shifted politically? I, I haven't got a clear picture of him in his political position in the 50s. You know, you said he's more radical, but, but how? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for a very fascinating uh, talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to follow on, 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 on Du Bois, and I think within the discipline of sociology, when, when we think of the, the, the canon, uh, I think for quite a long time, Bourdieu has been on the margins of the canon. Um, as, I mean, his work, in spite of it being very influential, it has not necessarily been put in, uh, in, in the sociological canon. So 
I, I just wanted your your thinking and 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 your your your, your reflection with regards to uh, canonizing uh, Du Bois uh, um, within the sociological uh, canon and and the possibilities of that and and also the implications of um, uh, neglecting uh, Du Bois' work within the sociological canon. Thank you. Okay, those were all great questions. Um, well, Frederick Douglass loomed, as you know, very, very large in every, every African-American person's eyes, not including Du Bois. Um, yeah. Uh, now I think I will, yeah, I think I would like to answer your question and also this split in consciousness. To, I think what is important to understand, to put Du Bois back into history, and our, part of that history is the, the, the existence of Frederick D Douglass, but it's, it's, he's writing, he's writing, Du Bois is writing after the Civil War, and again, how does he see the Civil War? The Civil War is won by the North only because African Americans, the enslaved population, defect from the plantations, half a million of them, join the northern armies, which were losing the war, and then it turns the war around. So he's trying to emphasize the agency of the enslaved. Um, so that, that, it, it, it is that, it is that attention to the actual lived experience of the of, of the African Americans, enslaved and non-enslaved, that sort of distinguishes him, his faith actually in popular revolt. He calls it actually in, the, in, in, in Black Reconstruction, that defection, the general strike. And you can see the connotation, he's got this vision of socialism. This is 1935 he's writing, and he's writing it, of course, about the Civil War in the previous century. Um, yes. So then DDT, yeah, he's, he hasn't got the same vision of history that Du Bois has, and why not? And this is, I think, come more to your question. I think Du Bois is sitting in an imperial country. He's very conscious of that imperial country, but that gives him a so it's seemingly global vision in the way that DTT, even though he travels quite a bit, nonetheless does not actually develop. He's not mixing with the same sort of intellectuals that Du Bois is mixing with, including socialists, um, and, and including, in, including figures like Frederick Douglass. So it's the context of the United States is actually giving Du Bois a enlarged picture and you know, when, when Plutke goes to the United States, he can't believe the space that African-American intellectuals have and, the, what, and how they develop their ideas. So I think what is very important is to understand the actual historical context within which Du Bois is writing, so different from DDT, with all due respect, but you know, who's very much rooted in, in, in a particular part of Southern Africa. And though he, with the All-African Convention, it becomes, of course, a national project. So I, I think this, that's the paradox of, of, of Du Bois. He's in an imperial country that gives him vision, but, but that, that, that he carries that imperialism with him when, in his more condescending perspectives towards Africa and later to see other countries, whether it's independence in India, whether it's racial, so-called racial democracy in Brazil. He sees it always through the lens of what is possible um, in the United States. Yes, a splitting consciousness. That's really very interesting. Well, DDT stands for Davidson, Don, Tango. It's the white and black is mixed up in his name. There's a sort of already there an imagination of a unity. It is so different from Du Bois's formulation of double consciousness in the souls of Blackwell, in which it is white, in which blacks are having to measure their own life by the tape of whites. It's a relationship of domination, not one of magical synthesis. So I think when, when, when Du Bois is writing in the souls of black folk, he's got an idea of, 
of domination that is, is less present, I think, in the early writings, um, the early writings of, of, of DDT. Yeah. I don't know if I'm really answering your, your question. It was, I'd have to think about it more carefully. But let me move on. Yes. Um, right. Yes. The, David, the radicalism. So what happens to Du Bois after 1920? See, his vision of socialism in 1920 is an imaginary vision. And there are other essays in Dark Water of 1920 of, 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 a, of a very utopian socialism that is clearly extracting from the people around the politics of that time. There's no, it's clear he actually says, he has never read Marx, he says later on at this point. But he has a vision of socialism. But then, in 1928, epiphany strikes, he goes to the Soviet Union for three months, and he comes back. If what I have seen is Bolshevism, if what I have heard is Bolshevism, then I am a Bolshevik. And so he then begins to embrace what he has neglected to embrace, and he blames his teachers at Harvard and at Fisk and even in Berlin, for not taking Marx seriously enough. He then dives into Marx. Exactly what he was reading, we don't exactly know. I have tried to figure this out. But he's clearly have read volume one of Capital, and perhaps German ideology. But he embraces Marx as one of the really great figures in the history of intellectual thought. And if you read Black Reconstruction in America, chapter one, black worker, chapter two, white worker, chapter three, the planter, chapter four, the general strike, chapter five, the coming of the Lord, which is this, this, this intense participation of, of, of the enslaved in the Civil War. And if you look at the end, you can see the back towards slavery, the counter-revolution of capital that brings the reconstruction to an end. And the vision of interracial democracy for the 11 years of the Reconstruction period after the Civil War. It's Marxian through and through. So the radicalism is his beginning to adopt, not beginning to, wholesale adoption of Marxism. And so after the war, he gets involved in the peace activism against nuclear weapons. And that puts him on the side of the Soviet Union. I'm not saying what, which is causing what. I think basically he was very committed to peace. And the US state doesn't like the effectiveness with which he is organizing the peace movement in the United States and globally. And so he begins to identify more and more closely with the Soviet Union. He's pushed into that position. And then China. And you know, he goes to China in 58. And, and once he gets his passport back, he goes to the Soviet Union in 58. I know in China, he, he, China in 58, 59, it's a great leap forward. It's a disaster story. It's like the Stalinist period in, in, in the Soviet Union. It doesn't say anything. This is a political strategy that he's looking now for anti-imperialism, anti-US politics. And he closely identifies with and talks about the racism in the United States on a red carpet in China and in the Soviet Union. So yeah, he's, he's moving on politically the whole time. And he's, he, yeah, of course, that's how the sociologists get. Oh, he was a Stalinist. That's how they dismiss him. Um, not again situating who he was in his time and the deep alienation he had for the United States. He was a brilliant, he knew he was brilliant. He, he, was, he had a sort of sense of himself. Um, but he was an extraordinary figure, and he was excluded from the beginning. The racism sort of entered in soul, and so you have to see that when you understand the Soviet, his embrace of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, when he goes in there in 28, he says, ah, this is a real attempt to remove poverty. They're really anti-colonial, and I don't see racism everywhere. That's his... That's his experience there. So, so, but sociologists for a long time had been able to dismiss him because he became an isolated figure as a Marxist who identified with the Soviet Union 
and so sociology booted him out, which is, which is the question, the last, the last question. Yeah, all right. Which is, yeah, with well, the implications. Do you want me to shut up? No. No, no. okay. Um, the canon, the canon, the canon. Simba, right. Yeah, the canon. See, what happened suddenly, in fact, when I was president of the, the American Sociological Association in 2004, the first plenary... It was all about public sociology. And the first plenary was the greatest public sociologist, W.B. Du Bois. And then it was an amazing plenary. You could have heard a pin drop. And suddenly people were seen. I'm not, obviously, I was not. I was just reflecting the times that he was already at the beginning of that century emerging, re-emerging. And then I suppose the catalyst for his for the idea he has a founder of US sociology comes from a book by Alden Morris called The Scholar Denied, in which he shows how Du Bois was actually a forerunner, a forerunner um, of the Chicago School by 20 years. Now, as I said, that's no great achievement. What we should be doing is bringing Du Bois into a relationship between Durkheim, Marx, and Weber. And if I were to give a different talk, that would be the talk. Though I cannot presume that everybody will be a sociologist here, so they might get bored stiff. But nevertheless, that is the, that is the interesting question. And I believe that you don't... There are different ways of dealing with, a, dealing with the entry of Du Bois. Some people say, well, that just shows we should have no canon. Other people say we should start a whole new canon, Du Boisian canon. Um, and other people's... Old people like myself who have been teaching the canon for 50 years, well, we've invested so much, we don't want to get up, give it up. We don't start all over again, right? So there are these, but my view actually, my own view is we have to reconstruct the canon and put Du Bois into a conversation with Marx, Faber, and Durkheim. They're living, of course, at a similar time. Only Du Bois outlives them by about 40 years. Um, but yeah, so that, well, that was my brief response that I think that we must bring in Du Bois, and I believe that by putting him into a conversation with Durkheim, Weber, and Marx, one or, one or more of those may disappear. Fine. Um, and, but I think Du Bois will benefit from it, and I think Marx, Weber, and Durkheim will benefit. The canon is dynamic. The canon is dynamic. And so I think just as when Marx was brought into the canon in the 1960s, we reread Durkheim and Weber, we bring in Du Bois, and we will reread Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. We're already rereading them. And so I think that's my reformist solution. What's it called, Eddie? Radical reform? Got it. Got it. I pinch all these things from South Africa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. At least I acknowledge them now. Uh, but anyway, that, that I think there are real radical implications of bringing Du Bois in. But let's take him seriously and let's recognize all the anomalies and contradictions within Du Bois. Let us not just be a vindicationalist and say, he solves all our problems. He is the wonderful person of the day. No, we have to engage him really seriously and recognize how he changes over his 95 years and how he reflects upon those changes. He writes four autobiographies, which are all consistent reflections about his participation in politics and as an academic and scholar. Whew. Okay, finished. And I should be short too, right? Yes. Um, Thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, I'm Toza my April. Um, uh, my background is history. I have a small um, uh, historical question, and mine is an archival question. When one thinks about Du Bois's address to the nations of the world at the closing of the first Pan-African Conference in 1900, ah. uh, that whole line uh, about the color line, ben. that is about right. to engulf the world. Right. What, what's, what's interesting for me is to ask questions about the archive that would informed, you know, the archive that would have informed Du Bois' uh, conclusion. Because when, when, when he took up the teaching post at um, Wilberforce in 1894, 1895, one of the people that he came across there, um, he taught uh, uh, Charlotte McLeague, whom uh -huh. I have a very um, uh, close relationship in terms of my scholarship. So there's something that we're trying to trace in terms of the archive of Du Bois at, at, at these 
epochal moments. And at the time when he makes that address in 1900, what would have informed the archive that made him realize that yeah, this problem of race is bigger than America. It's about to engulf the world. So I'm more interested in the archive that would have informed that decision in 1900. Thank you. Good, thank you. I think that's a question you should answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Prof, for um, you know this intriguing uh, debate. My question, um, as you touch on reconstructing the canon, you know, and um, looking at socialism and the capitalist <laughs> capitalism, you know, how do we tackle this issue of race, you know, without us being on each other's throat, you know, in, in order for us to, to make a better society, a better future for us, you know, drawing on the aspects of, of the boys. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, mine is about, about that one of, the, one of his lesser known essays, which you mentioned, The Souls of White Folk, which is always an essay which has fascinated me quite a lot because I work on on social histories of white people. Now, lots of, of, of black commentators before Du Bois had written on, on, on white people in America. Um, you find Ida B. Wells Barnett talking about the, the, the crowd, the racist crowd at the lynching. But, but Du Bois has a slightly different register. He, he, while not denying the question of white terror, in, in this essay, he, he, he talks about the barbarism which these white people have exacted upon each other and upon the world. And then he talks about what being white costs white workers, which is, it's, for me, it's, it's a point of extraordinary humanistic insight, but it's also a deep appeal for far more fundamental class solidarity than the type which was often imagined by, by socialists in the, in the imperial and colonial countries at the time. I think most notoriously of the, whites, of the white socialists in this country with the workers of the world fighting unite for a white South Africa. Now, could you tell us a little bit more about, about, about the genealogies of this argument um, that Du Bois makes? Because it's a, it's a rather odd argument. It doesn't really fit in dark water or anywhere else, but it's a very potent argument nonetheless. Mm -hmm. All right. Okie dokie. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Yeah, it's the, 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 the color line that bends, bounds, binds, but I've forgotten the exact word he uses, that binds, hmm? Hmm? No, it binds the world at something else. I, anyway, it doesn't matter. It circulates the world. Where did that come from? Right? It's 1900. That's, why he's, that's one of the most famous lines he, he, he offers us. Where did he get his global vision from? Well, it would be easy to say that he just had a genius. It, but I, as I was saying before, I think his position, you see this, the, the boys reflected all the time on his race and then on his class, but also upon his nation. And, you know, he had traveled to Germany where he saw, you know, he, oh, I, oh, you know, this is how he used to look in Germany. Oops, uh, let's see if I can. There he is. You know what they say in Germany, what some people have argued is that race is not the issue, it is how you look, how you dress. And you can, so that's, and so he didn't experience the same racism. So the world could be different, the world could be different. Um, but he saw also the United States was embedded in an imperial, already then I think, reflecting upon his, first, his dissertation at Harvard was on the repression of the slave trade. Um, in, in the United States. And so I think he already then had a global vision. Um, it is remarkable. And I think that, that you should 
Think about you. I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 where did it come from? Because he was quite distinctively Du Boisian. Yeah. So I, I think that his experience has led him that way. His research has led him that way. And his, yeah, his, his exclusion was so deeply felt. Yeah. I know that's not going to satisfy you. Okay. <laughs> drawing, sorry, drawing on socialism. So who, was, who asked me that? I'm sorry, I'm losing track here. Oh, yes, yes, right. Right, yeah. So, so the conception of socialism that he had, well, the, he had an imaginary conception of socialism here. It's what I call an imaginary utopia. But then when he writes Black Reconstruction, the Reconstruction period, which is the, basically the, 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 the 11 years that emerged after the end of the Civil War, uh, he talks about that period of reconstruction in a way that has never been talked, talked about before. Contemporary historians had always said it when, 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 when Africans, African Americans were given the vote, when they participated in politics, only disaster could follow. And it was a catastrophe. That was the convention of the Dunning School, as it was called. He says, no. There were potentialities here for interracial democracy. And he shows how, in fact, there were advances, particularly in education, but in welfare, not just for blacks, but also poor whites. So he's already there seeing something much more realistic that emerged historically. He called it, in the end, a splendid failure. But he could see that interracial democracy. That was already his conception of socialism. And then... Then, he has a, then later on, he develops a new social, notion of socialism. Well, not later on, it's exactly the same time. At the same time, he's writing the Black Reconstruction in 1935. There is the New Deal in the United States. And he can see that the New Deal is excluding many large sections of the African-American population. And so he's thinking that, ah, this is a famous book, The Dusk of Dawn, which is his second or third autobiography, depend how you count. But there he says, you know, and this is really a radical move for him. Racism is not skin deep. It's really deep, 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 deep down. And it's, it's, it, is, it is, as, as a famous sociologist would call it, a habitus. It is, it is not something that will, will bend in the face of science. So he says, perhaps we should take advantage of segregation. And perhaps we should build a... African-American cooperative economy. We should actually organize ourselves, in a sense, take advantage of segregation and build an alternative economy. Cooperative commonwealth, he calls it. So that is what he proposes at the time. The result is, of course, he breaks with the NAACP, which is, a, which is the organization that he had co-founded he breaks with them because they're into integration. He now look, now he seems to be advocating separation. Ah, oh, and that's, that is a, but he's seeing no development in the integrative legalistic approach of the NAACP. So that's another vision of socialism. And then of course, you know, he's got a vision of socialism that he gleans from the Soviet Union and China. So his ideas of socialism actually do take on a dynamic of their own as history unfolds. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the last question. Oh, yes, costs of white, yeah. The cost. You know, he says a wonderful thing in Black Reconstruction. He says, white workers prefer, prefer poverty to equality. They prefer to be poor rather than to accept blacks as equal. The assumption is that if white workers would understand their material interests properly, they would build unity with the black workers and they would engage in struggle and that would be progressive for the working class. So, yes, yeah, so he's, he's got, he never loses that possibility of an interracial class solidarity. He's always looking for it and evaluating history against it. And there are, of course, occasions when there is interracial class solidarity, as, for example, in mining unions at the beginning of the 20th century. So, yeah, I think that, yeah, I, yeah, we, we always think about the, the Rand Revolt and the white workers of the world unite for a white South Africa. 
And of course, there were definite elements, of course, in the white workers in the United States that felt similarly. Um, and he was railing against them. We will never get to your socialism, the socialism of you white workers, unless you first take race seriously. Finished. And Marx said something similar. He said, white workers will never, will, will, will never be liberated, will never be liberated as, so long as black workers are branded by their color. Only, only, only Marx assumed that white workers had to realize their interests. Du Bois, in the end, realized, or had a different view, that perhaps black workers are going to have to take the initiative in building interracial class solidarity. And it may take a global proletariat of the darker races to do that. Yeah, interesting. Ah, okay. Colleagues that I've cut out, you will mingle with Prof during uh, food and after the, the event. Um, I was told that there is entertainment, but before we can take one item, we will now uh, take an, an opportunity to invite our own VC, Professor Sakera, to give us some reflections. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the lecture, and then we can have that one item after him, and then we will have the vote of thanks uh, from Dr. Ferim. Thank you very much. I, I was very glad you skipped me, because I would have spoiled what was an absolutely fascinating time. And I know Michael, I can talk, he can talk. So I, say, I save time for you, Michael. Thank you very much. I actually, I have very little to say about the DDG Jabavu lecture, because this is only the second one. The first one was in 2017. Uh, it was started then for reasons that I will not go into now, which I would like to, but I wouldn't go to, into now. So I'm glad that uh, Professor, through the activity of Professor Roos, we've now, we're finding our rhythm. And Prof Roos, this is now, it must be an annual. It was intended to be an annual, and it shall be an annual. Uh, that's the one thing. The second thing, I'm very pleased, Ma Michael, I think you started something big here. I don't think you realize. Uh, you can hear by the sound of the questions, just by the tone and tenor of the questions, you're starting a big thing. You're like someone standing at the top of a, a big mountain, holding a big rock, and you're pushing it down. And it gathers momentum. And I'm looking at five years, 10 years now, on the works that will be, that will be produced, that look at this trans, these transcontinental conversations. You know, now, now that I can look back critically at us and our time, when I was, especially when I was at uh, VETS and other places, I, you know, globalization was this kind of fad, this fashion, and you know, that kind of thing. You know, the moment of globalization is exactly this. But it wasn't by WhatsApp. It wasn't by, via email. No, it was a typewriter or even pen and paper and people communicated across continents. But secondly, what, you, you talk, what you've done here, you're talking about our, our, the people that made us. The people that made us. They were networked. They were networked. And I think that's just the one big, uh, other big thing. I can say many big things about what you, you, you studied. So let's, I think, let's take Michael's lecture today as a challenge, as a call, as a clarion call to younger scholars, uh, uh, say, let, let's take it as, as that. That now Michael has done it. Those of us who are on the sixth floor, seventh floor, and even eighth floor, very soon, you know, will be out of the academy. Those who are in, on, this, on the second floor, third floor, fourth floor, even fifth floor, 
This is the time. And I think what Mark, Michael is doing here, he's starting this thing, but he's also handing over the baton to, 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 to the next generation. That's what it is. So when he answered uh, uh, um, Dr. April's question, that you better place to answer that question, I know that's a, that's a Michaelism, that's a Boravoism. That's exactly, he was telling you something quite profound, and in case you, you didn't pick it up, that's what he does. Now, for the, the only reason I agreed to even come up now is to name drop. Okay, I'm gonna name drop, and uh, the people I'm going to na whose names I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna ask them to close their eyes, because then they'll hear nothing. When the dean asked me to, he said, who do you want to invite? Who do you want to invite? Three people, I think he said. I said, David Cooper. Dave, there's a lot of reasons um, I can put on the table. Many reasons. But I'll make a confession. Dave, I took David Cooper's course when I was doing my honors year in 1985. I took his course, which had, had a profound impact, a profound effect on me. Not only because it was a good course, mm -hmm. but he did it with passion. Abakboni, Dave, just wave your hand, please. Some, some are asking, who's this Dave, this one? <laughs> it am very profound. I probably would not have ended up here had I not taken that course. So thank you, Dave, for making it. Are you, are you a, vote, a vote of thanks, uh, Dr. Ferrin? This is not a vote of thanks. <laughs> the, se the, the second name, and Judy's here, uh, uh, sorry, Dave is here with his partner, Judy. Just wave, Judy. <laughs> so they are here as my guests. Then the second name I'm going to drop. Again, I think had I not encountered him, uh, my life would not, would have taken a very, I don't know, direction. Some direction, somewhere. Okay, of course, I had to go somewhere. When I did, when I did a walkabout in terms of the job market, and eventually I decided to go back to study, and um, I changed courses, qualifications. And so I went and knocked in the office of one professor. He says, he says, who taught you? Who did you do your honors with? I said, David Cooper. He says, you in. <laughs> you in. And that person ended up being my PhD supervisor. I invited him because also had I not en encountered him, my life would have ended up, turned out very differently. Eddie, I'm gonna ask you, you, you to stand up. You're gonna to have to do this. You're gonna to have to do this. By the way, Eddie, Eddie, at, at 40, I don't call people by their first names. I call them doctor, professor, mister. But all of you, I, 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 you're fine. Thank you, Eddie, for making it. And uh, as I said, so it was almost I was passed down from, from Dave to Eddie. And, and it's still continuing. This is still continuing. All right. The third person, or the next person I want to acknowledge in her own right and invited uh, to this event in her own right is, I can say because we awarded the, the doctorate here, is Dr. Lully Kalinikos. <laughs> Thanks, Lully. Thanks for coming. I'm not going to say, and I didn't, you didn't hear from me, that Lully is Eddie's partner, because I don't want to, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but Lully did not teach me, but Lully's book, Gold and Workers, Golden Workers had an absolutely profound effect on me. 
And once again, had I not read that book, the way I think about the world, the way I think about people, the way I think about the institution, would have been different. Thank you very much, Ludli. I know pro program director Day is pinching herself now. <laughs> I can see her. The, the last name I want to drop, it's not just because of the wild worst, wild coast, wild coast uh, walk, which we did with Eddie and Michael and so on, and others, and, and Andres Besaidenot. I want to drop the, the name of Michael for a different reason. Because Michael was an external supervisor of my PhD. And I, I, I think I've known him since. And um, my, uh, I've known Michael, so it's not, it's, so, so he was not invited here because he was my PhD supervisor. <laughs> but he, he was invited here because he was doing this work, this groundbreaking work. But uh, I've known Michael since then. If you did not know Michael Buravoy, by the way, it's Buravoy, Buravoy. That is Buravoy. That's how you say it. If you did not know him, you must ask yourself a few questions about the kind of education you got. It doesn't matter what field. It doesn't matter what field. So thank you very much, Michael, for, for, for this. And again, it's, got, it's, it's getting me thinking. I'm already, as I said, I'm on the sixth floor already. I'm already thinking of a retirement kind of project. And uh, I, I, was, I got a, a, a few ideas here. And then finally, just Dr. Koena, when I told, told her that we're having this lecture, Dr. Koena is a, is a PhD in literary studies. Uh, from Smith College, no, a, a Temple, from Temple, but she went, she started at Smith, Massachusetts, and then went, uh, ended up at Temple. When I told her, she said, this is a topic, I'm, this time I'm not Deputy Chairperson of Council, I'm going there because I'm curious, I'm, 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 I want to be stimulated intellectually, and thanks Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Koyana for making it. Thanks everyone. I'm going to call Michael to come up here. This is dangerous. This is absolutely dangerous. Okay. <laughs> okay. Michael, come, come, come this side. But stand that side. This young man here, is, his name is Luko Yongo. Luko Yongo. You've got to say it, otherwise I'm going to send, send you back to your seat. Luko Kyongo. That's it, that's it. Please shake the professor's hand. Okay. <laughs> now, Luko decided that, uh, I want you to have a preview. Before they sit. Decided that this is Michael Rose. So I'm, I'm going to turn it now, and uh, he's going to hand it over. Just, just one thing. Luko is a is a student in fine art. I think a final year. Finally, a fine. Eh? Ma master, sorry, sorry. Final year masters. Yes, it's final year masters. Final year masters student here at, at Fort Hare, and uh, he's an he's an artist in his own right. There's one thing that he caught there without having encountered Michael is that Michael is, is restless. Doesn't stand in one place. You saw him. He was doing the thing here. Yeah? That's exactly Michael in action. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. I, should have, I expressed it at the beginning, I can only express it again. Um, 
I have the number of people here in the audience I have known for many, many years, very, my closest friends in the world. This, is, this South Africa has been a very, always an inspiring place. And Fort Hare, when I just think of the people who have been here, I just think it's the most extraordinary place for the cultivation of critical engagement. And I just want to congratulate the Vice Chancellor um, on leading this great community. And I do want to say one more thing to Luca, wherever you are. This, now this is a most extraordinary picture. Um, I suspect it was, I suspect it was um, linked to a photograph when I was lecturing to a picket line. Um, unless it's your imagination is even more great than I, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, this book is Michel Foucault, Discipline and Punish. <laughs> and I was lecturing to a huge assembly of striking students um, in the middle, on the picket line. But what is most remarkable about this, I was known for the particular clothes I wear. And one aspect of those clothes has gone down until I was in Berkeley for 50 years. They were the red leather pants. And at every celebration of the department, I had to wear the red leather plants. And they just looked like this. <laughs> I don't know how you did it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. All right. We'll take it. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, we will just have one item from the entertainer, and then we will have Dr. Ferrum for the vote of thanks, and then we will close the program. Oh, yeah, it's 
So, um, I'm, I'm going to, I think, reverse roles with him in this case and try to do what he was supposed to do. Um, reflections on the program, um, on the lecture. <laughs> um, I, I, I happen to be here by design um, on the program to close, uh, to, give, to cast a vote of thanks because I'm one of the co-conveners of the Noni Jabavo lecture. I was roped in by my dean, thank you very much. Um, but I also happen to be here coincidentally to close this program um, or to cast a vote of thanks. Um, we, we learned from the lecture that was delivered by Prof. Um, uh, it's called Pogavoy, I heard, um, that uh, Dubois died, well, I call it Dubois coming from a French, French speaking country, um, that Dubois died in Accra, Ghana. I happened to just be coming back from Ghana two days ago, Accra, Ghana, University of, of Ghana, um, and we were presenting, I was presenting a paper at the University of Ghana in an international conference which was reflecting on alternative epistemologies and practice, practices of teaching and learning in, Africa, in an African university. So it was about critical canons of knowledge production in an African university. And, and, and this lecture to me comes at a very timely, um, at a very timely moment, given the wave of decolonization that is blowing across, especially South African universities. Um, they, they, for a very long time, there's been what I would like to call the arrogance of Western rationale, and it's held a stranglehold um, as an authoritative source of knowledge generation especially on the African continent. And this has seen um, our universities get, getting kind of obsessed with internationalization. They're getting obsessed with benchmarking against Western standards, world, um, world rankings. Um, we always pride ourselves when we are ranked higher than other universities. And the effect of that is um, we see academics getting obsessed equally with their citation matrices with um, H indexes and how they can tower above and um, augment their position in that hierarchy on the pyramid of the global scientific community. And the ripple effect of that is we become detached from our communities, right? We use them simply as sources of data mining um, to advance our own research agendas and guard safely, jealously, um, religiously, those spaces. Um, so the whole idea is to retain power and maintain power. Um, we, we use 
pompous language and jargons um, to entrench our positions as academics. You need to come to our, um, to our higher degrees committees and proposal presentations and see how we brag about epistemologies and phenomenologies. Um, you think you, you've, you've gone to a traditional doctor and you need to perform all these rites and rituals. Students know exactly what they want to write about, right? Um, but they have to conform to the rituals of academic dogmatism. So I think part of the, the, the reason for, or part of the idea behind the Jabavu lecture is how to bridge that gap between academic spaces and the local communities, right? Um, how to ensure that what we are doing in the academic community is relevant to the societies and they are not just sources from which we can extract data and advance our, um, our academic career. Um, if we start to play a more impactful role in bridging that gap, then we would truly start solving the problems in society. Um, so as we continue this engagement, I would, I would like to one day see um, the, the, the Noni Jabavo lecture delivered by, by a knowledge holder. Why not someone from the, from the Jabavu family? Why not someone from Ntela Manzi, that Tata that you go to to collect data, that Magogo that you go to in, in Tanzania to collect data? Why can't we get them, tell their own stories? Of course, with all due respect to the keynote speaker. Um, there, there's a saying that um, until lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So as local communities, we have to be given an opportunity. They have to be given an opportunity to tell their own stories. Um, there, is, there is something in universities called um, a valedictorian. So he gives a valedictory speech. So this is basically the, the best performing student who makes a speech probably about how fulfilling the academic journey has been. Um, and, and I was thinking, I'm more interested in the worst performing student. Um, what has he got to say? What is his own story, his own experiences? Um, it, it's, it's probably going to <laughs> resemble a litany that is called from the Christian Holy Book of Lamentations, um, the trials and tribulations of university studies. So I think we, we should try to give a wide, open up a wide array, a wide platform as we seek for alternative sources of knowledge, as we seek for alternative practice um, or practices to teaching and learning in, in, in South African universities, we should open up that white space rather than closing them down as far as knowledge production, generation, and dissemination is concerned. Um, um, that said, um, I would like to uh, do what I was here for now. Thank. Um, I would like to thank um, my dean for this opportunity. On behalf of my dean, I would like to thank Professor Bugavoy um, for accepting the invitation to come all the way to our humble university um, to share a very rich history on, um, on, on, on Dubois and the, and the, and the, the, the link to, to, to Jabavu. Um, I would also want to thank, the, of course, the Noni Jabavu family for agreeing us to continuously host this lecture in, in honor of, of the family, or at the very least, to Noni Jabavu. Um, I would like to thank the VC, uh, our CEO, for being here. I remember when we first, I think the inaugural lecture, um, it was presented by Professor Wachella. He was also here. So I thank him for coming again. It's quite an honor to leave the 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 very demanding pressures of the university and spend time with us here. So you're very much appreciated for that. And I also want to thank, last but not the least, um, all the invited guests, staff members, academics, colleagues in the University of Fort Hare for being here. Um, I wish you all um, a safe trip back to your respective destinations, and I thank you. I now announce this. I like I like that line when he's he's dismissing us at the graduation. <laughs> so I want to do as he, he does. He is doing it. I now announce this congregation dissolved. <laughs> 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 uh, the refreshing. <laughs>
the refreshments, uh, if you can just maybe.